Good morning. Good morning. Welcome everybody. It's a nice brisk, say brisk, it's cold winter day. <laughs> we did get a little vacation from the cold this week for the warmer temperatures, so take them when we can get them. A couple of announcements this morning. Uh, we are having a retreat planning meeting after the worship service right here in the sanctuary today. Uh, the retreat is next weekend, so really looking forward to that. Uh, so we'll start the meeting around 11.10. That, that'll give you some time to go to Pilgrim Hall, grab a quick refreshment, and then uh, come on in here for the meeting. Also, uh, a friend of Amanda Hawks is collecting plastic bottle caps. They're going to be making a, uh, a bench, a memorial bench, uh, <coughs> using plastic. So next week, she will have a basket in Pilgrim Hall to co start collecting them. So if you have plastic bottle caps, uh, you know, those for, um, water bottles or pop bottles, uh, you know, please bring those in and, and contribute to the cause. Uh, she'd very much appreciate it. Are there any other announcements this morning? Yes. Uh, my class, the uh, post confirmation will remain in the service. We will not have class today because of the bells. Okay, so post confirmation class stay in the worship service. Any other announcements? Beth? Yes, the so Beth will be in Pilgrim Hall selling Swiss State dinner tickets. So, if you haven't gotten your ticket yet, please uh, do so. Uh, in the bulletin, if you happen to look, you'll see that I will be doing a class during Lent. And so, if you are interested in that, it will be on Sunday morning following worship. If you're interested, turn over that little green or whatever color your card is today in your bulletin, lavender. And on the back, please write um, Lenten study so that all of you are interested so we can start to get a count. Thank you. Okay, can you repeat the name one more time? Oh, Michael Stanfield's family. Okay, he lost his life this week in an accident, so prayers for the family. Any other announcements? <coughs> Seeing none, let us begin, begin our service. Thanks to the Lord with your whole heart. Sing praise before the Lord your God. Sing praise before the Lord your God. 
this not quite as cold, <laughs> but still really cold Sunday morning. It is great to see you. Uh, as, we, as we go to sharing joys and concerns, I get to go first. Um, Sue Gelati is not here this morning because her mother finally got moved late last night to rehab at Concordia. So please continue to pray for Betty Babix. She's, she's doing well enough to be in rehab. They're trying to get her back where she can get up on her feet and be a little more independent again, but she has moved, so continue to pray there. And also, yesterday morning, Chuck and I went to see Ray Suttle, who is back in Southwest. He is in the critical care facility there. Uh, he's, he's doing okay. He recognized us as soon as we came in, and that's a really good thing. But his body is struggling, so please keep Ray in prayer as well. So, what do you bring to the table this morning? Let's start with Alan. let you know that Michelle is following rehab. She's in uh, man care in Parma. So we're only five minutes away. Great. So your yeah. prayers are still working. Five <laughs> minutes away beats the heck out of driving down to the clinic. <laughs> Gabby. I have two joys. Uh, my uncle came back from Cal Denver, Colorado, and uh, on Thursday, <coughs> it was my grandmother's birthday. Nice. Thank you for sharing. For my two grandsons, uh, Jimmy and Michael, they had the they had to make the hardest decision of their life last night when they took their day off life support. Thank you. That is a really tough decision, Christopher. Um, I have a concern for my brother. He's um, having a procedure next week. Not this week. I don't know. Mr. Bond. Two major events this week. First is February 12th starts, officially starts spring training for baseball. Yes. <laughs> the second is uh, February 14th, Valentine's Day. I'm the luckiest guy in the world. I start, start to celebrate my 38th year with Adrian. Adrian for anniversary. Wow. You, you got married on Valentine's Day? <coughs> you old romantic, you. <laughs> Others? Betty. I have a joy. Last evening, my 11th great grandchild was born, Walter Jones McCain, to Haley Craig and <coughs> Joey McCain. Okay. Most of you will remember Haley and her mom and dad, Joe and Barbara Craig. Very good. And keep all the prayers a long <laughs> Go ahead. I have a concern. Uh, Jen's dad is having bypass surgery tomorrow, so any extra prayers would appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Others? I don't know if you heard me earlier. One of our Strongsville Special Olympian athletes passed away. Mike Stanfield, it was a freak accident, and there was nothing they could do to help him. Thank you. Let's pray together. Lord God, we give you thanks for your warm and comforting presence in this holy place. We ask your blessing and your comfort on those who are hurting or who are awaiting procedures or recovering from <coughs> procedures. And especially, Lord, we ask your presence in our hearts as we name those in our hearts who we just cannot speak the need out loud. We know that you hear, we know that you are present, and we know that in all times, troubles and triumphs, your holy peace settles upon us and leads us through and leads us forward. So Lord, as we continue into a new week that promises more adventures in winter, we simply ask that your warm present guide, presence guide us Keep us safe, keep us comfortable, and Lord, those who have no place to go, may you show us how we can reach out to them, providing them comfort, a bite to eat, directions to a place to stay, all those things that we often take for granted. Help us from our plenty 
to offer to those who have less or none. In this time together, Lord, lead us in our hearts as we pray together the prayer you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil.
So, and, and sometimes, you know, and, and this, is, this is funny but not funny. Sometimes, if you really want to focus on your prayer, you would actually have it around your head so that you're really kind of in your own little space and the whole world just kind of goes away. A little bit, only, you know, Jewish. And the thing is that Jesus had prayer shawls like this, or instead of having the shawl, he would have the knots on a belt around his waist so that he always had time and made time to pray. And so that's what's really important. It doesn't matter how you do it. Thank you, Richard. You can do it without a prayer shawl, obviously. But what does matter is that you find your way and your time to pray. So how about right now? Let's pray. God, I give you thanks for these beautiful children who come to learn more about you. I ask your blessing on each one of them that they would be drawn in curiosity closer to you and closer to your heart to learn more of what you have planned for them in their lives. In your name we pray. Amen. Wow, so good to see you. Thank you. write your check or open your billfold for the offering, you're thinking about what you're giving to this church or to this congregation. And that's true. That's part of it. But more than that, this is your offering back to God. And so even when maybe things in the church are, yeah, you're thinking, oh, I didn't really want to come this morning. I could have slept in. God is still here, and your offering is going to God and continuing God's work in this world. Thank you.
your presence in our hearts and in this place. We ask your blessing on each person, on the gift and on the givers. Each one of us, may we be drawn further along our journey, closer to you, together as the body of Christ. In your name we pray. Amen. Jesus helping some fishermen get their lives aimed in the right direction. Simon Peter, James, and John were present, but the focus on our text is on Jesus and Simon Peter. These men had all met Jesus and had begun to follow him, but they were not yet completely committed to his mission. This incident redirected their lives. Luke chapter 5. One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats, left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, and one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out little from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into deep water, and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night, and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had also done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. They came and filled both boats so full they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knee and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee. Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing and acceptable unto you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. It was a perfect summer evening. The sun was sinking lower, but there had to be at least another half hour, maybe more, of daylight left, time to play hide and seek trying to find that one place where no one would think to look. Time to imagine ourselves as Hank Aaron or Babe Ruth <coughs> facing off in the twilight, calling signals, burning it in over the plate, making a call worthy of Tom Hamilton himself as that pitch is taken way back out of here. Time to catch fireflies, to touch their green glowing behinds and giggle when our fingers glow, just like the firefly. Remember that old saying, red sky at night, sailor's delight? Truly so much still to discover, so many things left undone on my list, when out of nowhere, <coughs> time to come in, I need you. Where are you? Rats. You might try to ignore that voice for a while, but it persists. Come home, I need you. We have things to do together. 
You realize in your heart that it's time, time to brush off the day's adventures and head for home where a warm bath awaits, a chance to reflect on today's adventures and look forward to tomorrow's. Isn't that always the way? We're doing pretty well, thank you very much, making a life for ourselves, checking things off our bucket list. Oh sure, some things might be better, but overall, and then into the midst of our ordinariness, God shows up, sometimes appearing pretty ordinary himself. Other times, God's entrance is unmistakable and grand. Either way, when God calls, God expects us to answer. God won't force us to answer, but God doesn't just let us off the hook that easily either. Like a skilled fisherman, sometimes it seems as if God is playing with us, letting out the line and reeling us in over and over until finally God captures our hearts. Now I'm thinking Simon and the others would understand what I'm talking about in today's reading from Luke. Listen again to part of that passage, this time from Eugene Peterson's The Message. When Jesus finished teaching, he said to Simon, push out into deep water and let your nets out for a catch. <coughs> Simon said, Master, we have been fishing hard all night and haven't caught even a meal. <coughs> But if you say so, I'll let out the nets. It was no sooner said than done. A huge haul of fish straining the nets capacity. They waved to their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they filled both vo boats, nearly swamping them with the catch. Simon Peter, when he saw it, <coughs> fell to his knees before Jesus. Master, leave. I am a sinner. I can't handle this holiness. Leave me to myself. When they pulled in that catch of fish, awe overwhelmed Simon and everyone with him. It was the same with James and John, Zebedee's sons, co-workers with Simon. But Jesus said to Simon, there's nothing to fear. From now on, you'll be fishing for men and women. They pulled their boats up on the beach, left them nets and all, and followed him. Just another day in the ordinary lives of these fishermen. You know, some days are better than others, but overall they were pretty successful, middle-class businessmen. But today they had been working all day long and they hadn't brought in anything. You know, we can joke about going out in a boat and enjoying a lazy afternoon of drinking beer and drowning worms. But when your entire livelihood depends on that, bringing in those nets filled with fish, that humor falls flat. These men were tired, and their nets were empty. And now there's someone looking up over their shoulder, trying to tell them how they should be doing their job. Enter Jesus. Now, we don't know for sure if Simon and the Zebedee brothers knew Jesus already or not, but when Jesus spoke to them, Simon answered with the utmost of respect, addressing him as master or perhaps teacher. For Simon and James and John, this was about to become a teaching moment, one of those aha moments when their world <coughs> would be changed in the blink of an eye. Now, as Luke tells this story about Jesus calling the first disciples, there's something odd that happens. In Mark's version, Jesus is walking along the beach by himself. He sees Simon and the others and literally calls them to follow him. But here in Luke, Jesus is surrounded by folks already wanting to hear what he has to say. They're crowding around eager and curious about what this new rabbi is teaching. Jesus climbs into an empty boat, left standing while the fishermen were busy washing their nets, preparing for a better day tomorrow. He asks Simon to push out just a little bit from the shore, 
so more folks can hear him. Kind of puts him in a water pulpit. I wonder if Simon is a little bit annoyed by this. <coughs> After all, can't this man see we have work to do? Today was not a successful day. Tomorrow, they will have to work twice as hard. But Simon agrees anyway and pushes out from shore into deeper water. And the master begins teaching the crowd, but before long, he is teaching Simon as well. You know, there's nothing quite like having someone tell you what to do when it seems perfectly clear they should have no idea what they're actually talking about. What's that old expression about those who can't do teach? In life, nothing could be further from the truth. Yet as Jesus wraps up his teaching and instructs Simon to cast those nets one more time, one has to wonder. After all, this is the exact same spot they've been casting their nets all day long. Who is this guy trying to tell them how to fish? I imagine that's pretty much how Simon's interior monologue was going, but he remained respectful, and he even followed instructions and lowered the nets one more time, trying not to roll his eyes too loudly. Imagine. Imagine Simon's surprise when he drops the nets again and almost immediately they are filled to overflowing with not just guppies <coughs> and hobbies, but big, beautiful fish that will bring a good price at the markets. This is the catch of a lifetime. Simon's nets creak and groan under the weight of the catch and suddenly Simon is awestruck by the miracle that's unfolding right before his eyes. He and the brothers drop their nets and fall on their knees before Jesus. Looking at the bounteous hall before them, Jesus we or Simon weeps and cries out, Lord, please leave me. I am not worthy of <coughs> such a blessing. I am an unclean, sinful man. Please forgive me. All at once, what seems to be about a really great fishing experience becomes an awakening. <coughs> to borrow from John the Baptizer, Simon realizes he is not fit even to untie the sandals of this man, Jesus. Surely there are others more worthy than he. But apparently not, because Jesus is still there. Simon is trembling waiting for Jesus to agree with him, judge him, and punish him for his sinful nature. And what does Jesus do? I imagine a gentle smile crosses his lips as he shakes his head and extends a hand to Simon, lifting him to his feet in this waist-deep water, telling him, you have nothing to fear. He <coughs> never mentions Simon's lifestyle. He never brings up the fact that he's standing knee-deep in algae and slime, smelling of fish. He never mentions any of this. All Simon experiences in that close encounter with the Christ is love. Perfect, unconditional love. Out of that love, Jesus extends not only a hand, but an opportunity. Come, he says. Don't be afraid. Follow me. <coughs> and from now on, you will catch people, not fish. And in that moment, we are told, Simon and the brothers Zebedee dropped their nets and followed Jesus. They left the comfort and safe family lifestyle they had always known and set out in a new but oddly familiar direction. Some might wonder how they could just walk away from the family business, leaving their parents high and dry, so to speak. But I believe when Jesus placed this new mission before them to be catchers of people, some of the first people they caught were the people closest to them, their families, their close friends. We know, for instance, that Peter had a wife 
it's possible others did as well. While following Jesus certainly doesn't guarantee us a life of comfort and ease, I know Jesus never wanted us to be totally miserable on our journey. Practice casting your nets in familiar waters. When you've exhausted those waters, venture out a little farther. Trust Jesus. Personally, I cannot imagine being in ministry alone. I just can't. Come, follow me. Jesus speaks those words more than any other words. Come. As Paul would later put it in his letter to the church at Corinth, come and I will show you a most excellent way, the way of love. Wooing and pursuing, Jesus offered these men something no one else could. Without another word, without checking with anyone else, they gave in to the irresistible force <coughs> of love. Now this week in the lectionary, a pretty amazing thing happens. Did you notice the gospel reading from Luke and the Old Testament reading from the prophets match up really, really well? With the story of Simon's call in mind, listen again to these words from Isaiah. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying and they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. <coughs> Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I. Send me. Well, Jesus met Simon and the others in the midst of their ordinary lives. Isaiah saw the Lord in an extraordinary, grandiose vision. The imagery of these few verses are among the most beautiful descriptor of God's temple to be found. Imagine, imagine even a tiny room like the pastor's office being filled to overflowing with the presence of the Almighty and that's just the hem of God's garment. Imagine the noise Seraphs were nothing like those cute little cherubs we see on Valentine's Day. Seraphs were enormous creatures, fitted for battle with strong, powerful wings. Six of them. Can you feel the strength of the wind stirred up by their wings as they flew back and forth and back and forth? in never-ceasing songs of praise? Can you feel yourself shrinking and dis diminishing in importance like Alice down the rabbit hole? I may have felt it too. In the presence of the Most, I uh, most High, Isaiah became acutely aware of his insignificance and his uncleanness. And in that realization, like Simon, Isaiah fell to his knees and cried out to the Lord for forgiveness. 
Now, some people think of the Old Testament God as a wrathful, angry God. This passage shows that simply is not the case. When Isaiah cries out for mercy, he receives mercy. And as a marker or sign of that mercy, one of the seraphs touches Isaiah's lips with a red-hot coal, and <coughs> Isaiah is cleansed. But did you notice Isaiah was not burned by the coal or hurt in any way? It was simply an outward and visible sign of what the Lord was actually doing in Isaiah's heart. God poured out forgiveness when Isaiah asked, and it was very, very good. Oh, but wait, there's more. Isaiah could have decided there was nothing more to do. He could have celebrated the fact that he was forgiven, thanked God, and gone home about his business. But he didn't. He thanked God, and he paused to listen as the voices around him continued to offer praise and worship. Through the voices came a new voice, the voice of the one true God, posing a question, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Without a moment's hesitation, Isaiah speaks up, here I am, send me. He doesn't even know what God is going to ask of him. All he needs to know is that God has something that only he can do, and that he is equipped exactly to do that. <coughs> Even in the next few verses, as the day detail out what God is expecting of Isaiah, and believe me, it's not all fun and games. Isaiah never wavers, never tries to back out or make excuses. He simply offers his whole self to the Lord for whatever purposes God might need him. Two call stories, two faithful responses, one from Isaiah, one from Simon Peter. Two men willing to live into God's promises, no questions asked. Despite dire warnings, despite his gut feelings, Isaiah went on to speak the word of the Lord to the nation of Israel. Words that Israel did not always <coughs> want to hear. He died a martyr's death, being sawn asunder. And Peter, you may recall, was crucified, as was Jesus. But at his own request, he asked to be crucified upside down, because he felt he was not worthy to die the death his Lord had died. Jesus made sure his disciples understood, living a life Faithful to one's calling will not always be easy or comfortable. Thankfully, such torture methods have fallen by the wayside, at least in this part of the world. But what hasn't changed is this. When God calls you, God won't force you <coughs> to respond. But when you choose to answer God's call, you never ever answer alone. Even when the way seems difficult or filled with pain, God is with you. The way of the Christ is the way of love. Keep your eye fixed on the one true God. He will never, ever lead you astray or let you go. Let's stand together now and sing hymn number 479, softly and tenderly. <laughs>
find relief, find mercy. The next move is yours, but Jesus is always extending the invitation to come. So as you go, go in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and be glad. Amen. Yeah.